Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the Pearson Excel International A Level, Chemistry Unit 3 for October 2023. Let's begin with the first question. Question 1 says, a student is given three solid compounds A, B and C. Each solid contains one cation and one anion. Two of the cations are known to be sodium and potassium. In part A, the student carried out flame tests on separate samples of each solid to identify the cation in each. Describe the method for carrying out a flame test. A flame test is carried out using concentrated hydrochloric acid as well as a platinum or nichrome wire. So we add a few drops of the concentrated hydrochloric acid onto the sample and then we dip the nichrome or platinum wire into the sample. Then we place the wire into the non-luminous part of the flame and observe the color that is going to be produced. The next part says complete the table of results. In compound A, the formula of the cation is sodium and this should be a yellow flame. For compound B, the cation is potassium and the flame should be lilac. For compound C, because the color was pale green, the cation is going to be barium 2+. plus. In part B, the student prepared separate solutions of A, B and C using distilled water and then added dilute nitric acid followed by aqueous silver nitrate to each solution. A precipitate formed in all three mixtures. They say identify by name or formula the three anions that could be present. When dilute nitric acid is added accompanied by silver nitrate, we are trying to test for halide ions and these are going to be chloride, bromide or iodide because all these three are going to form precipitates. Next they say compound A, B and C each contain a different anion. They say describe a chemical test on the precipitate formed in B that could be used to confirm which anion was present in each compound and they want you to give the results of each test. Because the halide anions produce precipitates of silver, we begin by adding dilute aqueous ammonia and this is going to cause the silver chloride to dissolve so the color will change from a white precipitate to a color solution but the rest will remain as precipitates. Then to distinguish between silver bromide and silver iodide, we add concentrated aqueous ammonia and only silver bromide will dissolve but silver iodide will remain insoluble. So this brings us to the end of question 1. Let's continue to question 2. In question 2, the molar volume of carbon dioxide may be determined using the reaction between calcium carbonate and ethanoic acid. The equation for this reaction is shown. So this is the equation for the reaction. And for the procedure in step 1, they say place 30 centimeters cubed of one mole per decimeter cubed ethanoic acid into a boiling tube. In step 2, set up an apparatus to collect the carbon dioxide produced over water in a measuring cylinder. In step 3, place approximately 0.1 grams of calcium carbonate powder in a clean dry weighing bottle. And in step 4, weigh the weighing bottle and its contents accurately. In step 5, remove the bang from the boiling tube and tip the calcium carbonate into the boiling tube. Quickly replace the bang in the boiling tube. In step 6, when the reaction is finished, measure the volume of gas collected in the measuring cylinder. And in step 7, we weigh the weighing bottle. In step 8, repeat the experiment 5 more times, increasing the mass of calcium carbonate by about 0.05 grams each time. And do not exceed 0.40 grams of calcium carbonate. In the first part, they want us to draw a diagram of the apparatus used to carry out the reaction and collect the carbon dioxide produced over water in a 100 cm cubed measuring cylinder. They say do not show stands or clamps. Here I drew my boiling tube where the experiment is going to take place. I place the bung and then the delivery tube. The delivery tube delivers carbon dioxide into a trough containing water and then we have an inverted measuring cylinder. The carbon dioxide released from here is going to come through the water and then it's going to be collected in the cylinder that is invited over water. The key thing you have to ensure that the delivery tube goes deep into the water and you have to make sure that the water is above the place where the measuring cylinder is stopping within the trough. In part B they say explain why ethanoic acid is used and not hydrochloric acid. Here because hydrochloric acid is a strong acid the reaction will be very vigorous and some gas would escape before the bung is replaced. So I said ethanoic acid is a weak acid and the reaction would be more rapid if HCl was used and some carbon dioxide gas would have escaped before the boiling tube was sealed. In part C, a student suggested that the mass of calcium carbonate could be measured by weighing the weighing bottle empty and then when containing the solid. 
give a reason why the method described in step 4 and step 7 is preferred. If we go back to here, in step 4 they say weigh the weighing bottle and its contents accurately, and then after they weigh the weighing bottle again, this is to make sure that any solid that is left on the weighing bottle is accounted for because they did not use water to transfer the washing so some solid could have remained behind. So I said the method used accounts for calcium carbonate that is left in the weighing bottle since water was not used to transfer the washings. In Bratti, the results of the experiments are shown. As the mass increases, there is an increase in the volume of carbon dioxide produced. Moving on. So here they see a plot the data on the grid. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. So you can see this is the graph space provided. On the vertical axis, I have the volume of carbon dioxide, while on the horizontal axis, I have the mass of calcium carbonate. As more calcium carbonate is added, the volume is going to increase, but we have one anomalous result. I drew my line of best fit through the data set, which is that, 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 and that. This was left out. And down here they say, use the graph to determine the volume of carbon dioxide found when 0 0.25 grams of calcium carbonate is used. You must show your working on the graph. So I came to the graph below here, the point where we have 0 0.25 grams, and I drew my line connecting to the line of best fit. In this side I connected and I got 52.5, which is the volume that I wrote here. So 52.5 centimeters cubed, and that was my answer. Next I say, calculate a value for the molar volume of carbon dioxide using your volume from D2 and the equation for the reaction. So this is the equation for the reaction. But from the experiment, we saw this is the volume that is going to be obtained. So I'm going to use that volume. If I do that, I need to find the molar mass of calcium carbonate. So the moles of calcium carbonate are mass divided by the molar mass, which is 0 0.25 divided by 100.1. And again, this is the mass that was used to generate the volume, which was 52.5 centimeters cubed from the graph. So that gave me this number of moles. And from the equation, the mole ratio of calcium carbonate to carbon dioxide is 1 to 1. So the moles of carbon dioxide are equal to the number of moles of calcium carbonate. So I'm going to use this to find the molar volume. Molar volume of carbon dioxide is volume of carbon dioxide divided by the number of moles, which is what I substituted here. And my answer came out as 21021 centimeters cubed per mole, or I can divide by 1000 to convert it to 21.021 decimeters cubed per mole. In part E, give two reasons why the molar volume obtained by this method is lower than the data booklet value. Assume the experiment is carried out correctly and that the gas volume is measured at room temperature and pressure. The only reasons are two. Number one, if the gas is kept, because remember, a bank had to be placed, but if somebody who is placing it did a little bit slower, some gas is going to escape. And also, some carbon dioxide could have dissolved in the water because it had to pass through the water before it was collected in the measuring cylinder that was invited. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three. Cyclohexane may be prepared from cyclohexanol using 85% phosphoric acid. So this is the reaction. They say a simplified procedure for this preparation is shown. In step one, accurately weigh about four grams of cyclohexanol into a pear-shaped flask. In step two, add 0 0.5 centimeters cubed of 85% phosphoric acid and a few anti-bumping granules to the flask. In step three, set up the apparatus for fractional distillation. In step four, here the flask can collect the distillate that contains impure cyclohexene and water. And in step 5, separate the impure cyclohexene and water using a separating funnel. In step 6, add a few granules of anhydrous calcium chloride to the impure cyclohexene and allow the mixture to stand. And in step 7, decant the impure cyclohexene into a clean pure flask, distill the cyclohexene and weigh the distillate. We're given some data in the table here. They've given us cyclohexanol, the molar mass is here, and then the boiling temperature and the corresponding density, and cyclohexane, molar mass, boiling temperature, and corresponding density. They say bottles of cyclohexanol and cyclohexane have the hazard labels shown. And of course, here we see this is flammable. The hazard symbol is for flammable, and this hazard symbol is for environmental hazard or something that is hazardous to the environment. So that was the answer to the first part here. The next part says for each compound, state one way in which the risk due to the hazard shown could be reduced when carrying out this preparation. 
for something that is flammable like cyclohexanol, you can use an electric heater. And for cyclohexane, because it's an environmental hazard, you avoid wasting it down the drain in the sink. You have to power it in a special organic waste container. In part B, state how anti-vamping granules make liquids boil more smoothly. The anti-vamping granules provide nucleation sites for the growth of the gas bubbles. In part C, the diagram shows the apparatus used for fractional distillation in step 4. So this is the setup and we can see the fractionating column as well as the condenser and where the distillate is collected. So they say suggest two reasons why fractional distillation is used rather than simple distillation. If you go back to the table, from this table we can see the boiling temperature of cyclohexene is 83. However, the other product was water whose boiling temperature is 100 degrees. So it's going to be hard for us to use normal distillation. So fractional distillation is going to be the best one in separating the two substances whose boiling points are kind of close together. So here I said, cyclohexene boils at 83 degrees Celsius while water boils at 100 degrees. The fractionating tube or fractionating column is longer and it allows for better separation because cyclohexene and water have close boiling points. In part D, they say draw a diagram for the separating funnel and its contents in step 5, labeling each layer. If you go back to the table, the density of cyclohexene is less than 1 gram per centimeter cubed, so it's going to be on top as water is going to be at the bottom. So this is the separating funnel. You have to show the top. You have to show that it's closed here, but then water has to be in the lower layer, while the cyclohexene has to be in the upper layer, because it has a lower density than the density of water. In part E, they say explain the change in appearance of the liquid when it's allowed to stand with an hydrous calcium chloride in step 6. And hydrous calcium chloride is a drying agent. Before it's added, the liquid is going to be cloudy. However, the anhydrous calcium chloride removes the water and the liquid is going to become clear. In part F, state a suitable temperature range for collecting the distillate in step 7. Because the boiling temperature is 83, I use the rule of plus or minus 2. So to add 2, it's going to be 85, and then to subtract 2, it's going to be 81. So my range is 81 to 85. In part G, in this preparation, 3.96 grams of cyclohexanol reacted to form 2.09 grams of cyclohexane. Calculate the percentage yield by mass in this preparation. So I tried to write some reaction. Of course, this is going to become that, but we know there is water. So since this is the mass that is going to be used, and this is the mass that was obtained in the experiment, that is the actual yield. So I'm going to use this mass to find the theoretical yield. Since we were given the molar mass of cyclohexanol to be 100 grams per mole from the table, I'm using that to find the number of moles of cyclohexanol, which is going to be the mass divided by the molar mass, giving me that. And the mole ratio of that to that is 1 to 1, so the moles or theoretical moles of cyclohexane are going to be the same as the moles of cyclohexanol. And the theoretical mass is going to be the number of moles times the molar mass, giving us this number of moles times the molar mass, which is 82. And here I got that. Now, percentage yield should be the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100, and I get 64.4% as my answer. In part H, separate samples of cyclohexanol and the cyclohexane product were tested with phosphorus pentachloride and with bromine. Complete the table to show the observations. Now, for cyclohexanol, if you test it by adding PCO5 or phosphorus pentachloride, this is a test for the OH group. And because in cyclohexanol, an OH group exists, there is going to be misty fumes, but for cyclohexane, no OH group, there is going to be no observable change. And when we test using bromine water, there is no observable change with cyclohexanol because bromine water tests for carbon-carbon double bond. Since cyclohexane has a carbon-carbon double bond, the color is going to change from brown to colorless as bromine is decolorized. So this brings us to the end of question 3. Let's continue to question 4. Question 4. A student is required to determine the concentration of hydrochloric acid using a solution of sodium carbonate of concentration 0.105 mol per decimeter cubed. This is the outline procedure. Fill a clean burette with a hydrochloric acid and then pipette 25 centimeters cubed of sodium carbonate solution into a conical flask and add a few drops of metal orange indicator. Carry out a rough titration and then carry out accurate titrations until concordant results are obtained. The first part says state the color change of the indicator at the end of the titration. So the color is going to change from yellow to orange. In part B, 
the diagram shows the burette at the end of the rough titration. They say give the burette reading of this rough titration. If you can see, this is 23, so that's 23.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. We read the base of the meniscus, so it's going to be 23.40 centimeters cubed. And that is two decimal places, so that's my answer. In part C, the student refilled the burette and prepared a second conical flask by adding sodium carbonate solution and methyl orange indicator. Describe how an accurate titration should then be carried out. Because the student has already prepared the conical flask, all they need to do is to add hydrochloric acid into the conical flask quickly until a few centimeters towards the end point. This could be five centimeters before the volume used in the rough titer. And then they add dropwise while swearing until the indicator color just changes to a permanent color, in this case, which is going to be orange. In part D, the mean titer from two accurate titrations was 22.65 centimeters cubed. Calculate the concentration of the hydrochloric acid in mole per decimeter cubed. The equation for the reaction is shown, which is this one here. So from the experiment, this is the concentration and that is the volume. So I'm going to begin by finding the number of moles, which is concentration times volume, which is that times that. But my volume has to be in decimeters cubed, so I divide it by 1000. And using my calculator, I get 2.625 times 10 power negative 3 mole. The moles of HCl are going to be twice these moles because the ratio is 1 to 2. And this gave me 5.25 times 10 power negative 3 mole. And finally, the concentration is number of moles over volume, which is these moles, divided by the volume from the titration, which is 22.65. But again, that has to be in decimeters cubed, so I divide it by 1000. And my answer was 0.23178808. Rounding off to three significant figures, I got 0.232 mole per decimeter cubed. So this brings us to the end of question 4 as well as to the end of the whole paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye bye.